And Rick, I believe you tried the first death penalty case back when we reinstated the death penalty in 1978, I believe. Yeah, that's correct. It was a kidnapping murder case. It was because of the amount of publicity. It was moved from St. Louis to Kansas City. I was basically, I've been out of law school three years, and it was up to me to learn everything I could about capital jurisprudence, which was a lot to learn. We ended up trying it in Kansas City. So give us some perspective on what's going on here. We just heard Jim say in six months more execution than the past seven years, even a little more than that, I think. Um, and now we're on pace, if that's a word you can even use in a conversation like this, to break a record, if you can use that word, for executions in a year. Are, what, is this just because we have a, uh, a backlog of some kind, or have we increased our rate in some other way? I think it's because of the backlog. There was a you know pretty significant period of time where the lethal injection issue with the uh, uh, three drug cocktail was being litigated and that took quite a bit of time to litigate and then the Department of Corrections just sort of boom changed the entire uh, format of how they were going to do the executions which has resulted in additional lethal injection litigation that's still ongoing. So, But, but during that period of time no one was being uh, brought up for execution. The Missouri Supreme Court was not issuing warrants for execution. And that, then I think then, uh, pro you know, probably with a change of the personnel in the court, plus the fact that that litigation is no longer uh, viable, I think that's the reason you're seeing so many quick and consistent executions. Some people may wonder if they're in a hurry, uh, if they think perhaps there's a, a window and things may change in terms of the legality? There's no question about it, because I think that what you, what you find is, the, is, is, as Chris McDaniels commented, the amount of secrecy and the lack of transparency that's going around along the issue of how these drugs are obtained, how they're secured, you know, bag men crossing state lines with bags full of cash, that's because they know that eventually this will become a big problem. That's the reason for the secrecy. Okay, is this just a distraction like the prosecutor was saying? I mean, if you think following the law is a distraction, um, no, I don't think it's a distraction at all. I think that, that if anybody ought to be accountable for following the law, it should be the, the government. And what we're finding, it's, it, you know, Sue McGraw had mentioned it's an issue of the Eighth Amendment. It's not just the Eighth Amendment that's being violated here. We absolutely know that there are provisions of the Food and Drug, Do Drug Act that are being violated here. Um, there's a number of due process issues, equal protection issues. So certainly this is not a distraction. There, there are real issues here in terms of the fact that, that our state is, is absolutely violating the law in, in executing people. And, and I, I, I hope that the people of the state don't see that just as a distraction. This is the law of our land. I mean, is the states, are the state's hands not tied to some degree when it comes to they have uh, what they see as valid reasons for some level of secrecy around how they do this? And then our Supreme Court has, has not said that this is a violation of the cruel and unusual punishment. Well, first of all, cruel and unusual punishment is, is, not, the is, is not the only issue in terms of the legal violation. Violations. Um, our Supreme Court has, has not said that, but we haven't been given the opportunity to adequate litig adequately litigate these issues because we haven't been given, given access to the information that we need in order to litigate these issues. This veil of secrecy is a cloak that insulates them from any kind of real review in terms of what is going on. And so that, that's all the veil of secrecy is. It, it insulates them. It's, it's counter to our entire principle and system of checks and balances because it, within our government because there is no check on the DOC right now. They're keeping things secret and, and nobody knows what's going on and therefore we, it, it makes it impossible for us to, to even find out whether the law is really being violated or not. Do you see anything changing on that? I mean, is there a way that uh, you defending someone on death row could get, have access to the information you need to, 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 to prepare an adequate defense and that doesn't necessarily have to be public information at the same time? Well, I, I, I think there is a little bit of a trend actually in the last two days. These secrecy issues are not unique to Missouri. Um, it, it's a little bit ironic the way it's, it's happening within the country that Department of Corrections as a whole, there's been a trend toward covering up this information in terms of the suppliers of drugs and things like that. At the same time, Department of Corrections are trying to rely on 
less reliable sources for the drugs. So it, it's kind of a time when we need to know this information more than ever. But two courts in the last two days have ruled that it's a violation of due process, that it's, it's not giving inmates access to the courts, and therefore it's a violation of due process to continue to withhold this information. And they've ruled that under the United States Constitution. So I think that Missouri courts are going to need to be looking uh, very closely at these issues, and, and ultimately, I hope it's a it's a it's a issue that the Supreme Court may decide as well. One of the fact in Oklahoma, where the uh, Department of Correction from Missouri was sending their bag man with uh, the cash in hand to buy the drugs from the apothecary shop, which uh, Chris McDaniel's discussed. Uh, that that uh, judge in that particular state said, "This is it. You cannot execute anyone. We're stopping them because you're violating their due process and access to the courts." Anybody who looks at the legal record on the case of the lethal injection will be convinced that the Attorney General and the Department of Corrections have done nothing but try to obstruct and stonewall and stop a legitimate inquiry into what is these processes and procedures. Uh, let's uh, maybe close with your long view uh, here, and maybe, and, and, and this is open to both of you, of course. Uh, She'll how, interrupt me if she wants That's to. perfectly fine. <clears throat> um, what have you seen in terms of how this issue has evolved over the years you've been uh, dealing with it, and maybe where do you see it going? I'm going to let Kay talk about the lethal injection, but what I see as the trend in capital punishment, when I first started doing capital punishment a long, I mean, it's a long time ago, and there was a big push towards it. I don't think that there's a big push towards it at this point in time. I think that the, that the populace is now believing that, they, that the death penalty doesn't work. The exonerations that have occurred, that uh, Grant mentioned 144 exonerations, those are convincing people that this system may not work. And I just think that the death penalty is not on the rise in terms of popularity. You're finding more and more states imposing moratoriums, and you're finding more and more governors and legislators re-examining and re-evaluating whether it's worth it. As Sue McGraw said, this stuff costs at least three times. California spent $4 billion since 1978 on death penalty litigation. That's crazy. We'll, we'll leave it there. Kay, stick around for the post show, if you don't, which we put okay. on the show. So you don't have to wait. <laughs>